this week's very prestigious, very amazing NIM community call. People still say that the NIM community calls uh, are the most prestigious events in the world. Uh, you can't blame them. It is true. Uh, you heard it here first. Uh, today, I have with me two very special guests. One uh, you already know, one you hopefully already know. Uh, I have with me Diane today, who's our social media manager. You, you may know her, her from uh, our uh, Twitter spaces and some uh, events that we co-hosted earlier together. How's it going, Diane? Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think I'll be here more often than before. So yeah, looking forward to talking with you more. That's exciting. It's exciting to hear because we're all really fed up with Hux anyway. So um, uh, the more free time you can get from him, the better. We're just joking. We all love Hux, by the way. Don't, don't worry, guys. We love Hux. And of course, the meat and potatoes of today's uh, community call, um, Bart Pernil, NIM advisor and prolific um, cryptographer. How's it going, Bart? Doing great, and it's a pleasure to be uh, on the community call. Likewise, it's a, it's a true, true, true pleasure uh, to be able to bring you on. But before we get to our conversation, as usual, uh, we're going to go through a quick news roundup as to what happened uh, over the week um, in the world of NIM. Diane, take it away. Yes, yeah, so first of all, Eid Mubarak, everyone. I hope I'm saying it right, but uh, happy holiday. Um, so let's start with the dev updates for this week. So um, we had the um, mainnet testing for the NIM VPN on uh, for Ubuntu and Mac OS. We also had the integration uh, with Kepler Wallet um, to make it easier for you to stake your NIM tokens. Uh, we have much more progress on the NIM VPN front, as always, with uh, more integration with the NIM mainnet and connections in over 30 countries now. Uh, we're also working on website enhancements on the SEO side. And um, yeah, as you may have known from before, the fast and furious testing for the mixed net and imp performance improvement. And yeah, so this uh, month we're really focusing on boosting mainnet performance and preparing for the NIM VPN alpha launch, as you may know. Yes, on to you, Sudo. Right, so next up, uh, something that is not going to be new to anybody who uh, attended these community calls for a while, uh, our logo for NIMVPN is, in, is an eclipse. And as you probably know, we've just had a full solar eclipse um, uh, on Monday. So um, to pay homage to this, uh, to this very rare occasion, we released a blog post um, explaining why NIMVPN has the logo. Most of, most of the info that's in there you probably already heard from the community call with Pablo, our designer, who went through uh, the uh, the design and also uh, the whole thought process behind it. So if you're interested, make sure to, sure to check it out. Hopefully, uh, there is going to be a link shared in the chat uh, to the community call as well and the new blog post uh, about the same. Over to you, Diane. Yes, we also have a new blog post that was posted last night about VPNs and MixNet. Uh, what's a MixNet? How it can empower the best new VPN for privacy in the VPN. So it tells you all about uh, the usual metadata leaks and normal VPNs. What's a MixNet? The origins of a MixNet and how NIMVPN puts the two of them together. It's a really interesting and easy to understand piece. Right, and next oh. up uh, is the. Next up is the fact that our uh, DevRel Serinko and Hawks and Ade and Harry from the core team are all in uh, Amsterdam at Eve Dam. So if you if you're there as well, uh, make sure to say hi. Diane, did I miss anybody? I, I think I missed someone. At least one person. No. Uh, no. Um... I mean, we do have the schedule for ETH Dam that was posted on Twitter. So do check it out. It starts today, and then we have an event every day until Saturday. All right. Um, next up is a quick uh, node operator news roundup. So as you guys know, we currently have uh, a network performance testing um, uh, series going on, which we're calling uh, Fast and Furious. Uh, we now have uh, now have completed Fast and Furious 1, 2, and 3. I'm really mad at the team for not calling uh, 3 uh, its actual name, which should be Tokyo Drift. Because if you, don't, if you guys don't know, uh, Fast and Furious 3 was Tokyo Drift. I had it as my ringtone on my phone, the original soundtrack when I was like 12 years old. So I'm really offended by this mistake that the team made. But anyways, so these testing events... Uh, are putting the mixnet under some stress, some real world stress, which simulates uh, some real world usage really well. Um, and um, this is really great for, of course, us because we can we can get uh, gather information about how the, the mixnet behaves under uh, real world uh, conditions. And also for you, of course, as a node operator, um, it is a great opportunity for you to uh, for you to uh, test the stability of your node. Um, so, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, new recurring time of these tests is always Tuesdays. For for the for the uh, duration of these tests, we made um, 
uh, we made the um, operator AMAs on a weekly basis. So uh, every Tuesday during the operator operator AMA, which will be at uh, 4 p.m. Uh, CET, we will also conduct the uh, uh, the testing. And um, uh, there was a blog post also released about um, some findings uh, uh, that we uh, uh, that we gathered from from the tests, and also a bit of an in depth explanation of what these tests actually do and what they are for. And with all of that said, thanks for your patience, Bart. Uh, this was all the, the news roundup, and now we're moving over uh, to uh, our conversation. Now, first of all, uh, like I mentioned in the uh, in the private intro part of this uh, of this chat, you've been on my hit list for quite some time um, to uh, to bring you on as a guest, not, not in other ways, but just to bring you on as a guest to the community. Um, hopefully, the audience will understand why by the by the time we uh, we finish this chat. But for now, please introduce yourself. What should people know about you? My name is Bart Prenel. I'm a cryptographer um, and I'm based in Leuven in Belgium, where I had the Cossack Research Group. And so I've been working in this field since the late 80s. And so I'm also the proud PhD supervisor of Claudia Diaz, who was actually uh, one of my first PhD students um, a while ago. Um, and then I guess I've always been very interested in doing on the one hand research, changing topic on a regular basis. So I've worked on many areas, um, cryptanalysis, I worked on symmetric crypto, I worked on hardware, on privacy, um, on blockchain topics. So I've always uh, found new challenges in my life. And also very important for our research is we want not to just only great academic research, but also have it applied in the real world. All right. Uh, now you already mentioned, um, uh, you already alluded to the, the, uh, the lore, that is that is shared between you and Nim because because uh, you and Nim go way way back so you're tightly woven woven into the uh, the history and even the prehistory of Nim uh, and I, I really like to explore that history and prehistory on these calls so um, uh, can you please uh, tell the story from the the story and and maybe the the prehistory of Nim from your perspective. So in the very prehistory, I was actually involved as a PhD student on one of the first uh, EU funded projects on cryptography. It was actually in the race times. Race was focusing typically on um, networking. So Europe wanted to build secure networks. And what we did was actually we launched a project, I guess as I just participating in PhD student. Um, but the person in charge of the project was David Sharma, who is very well known in the privacy community. So what we were doing was actually um, trying to look at cryptographic building blocks and evaluate them, have a kind of Olympic game for cryptographers. An open competition was a very um, innovative idea. But this project was evaluated and got very positive reviews. And then actually it was stopped. Because at some stage, the secret services of France, Germany, the Netherlands, and the UK realized that academia was going to do cryptography with EU funds. It was not acceptable. And so there was a big fight. Um, I was not going to the meeting, but my professors had to go to meetings with people um, in long raincoats and big black cars. And there was, was some heavy debates. And in the end, there was a compromise found. We could actually work on cryptography, but not on confidentiality or encryption or privacy. In fact, the project was renamed into RIPE, Race Integrity Primitives Evaluation. So no confidentiality, only integrity. So no encryption could be done in the project. I mean, the project Emmet was a pretty successful project. And maybe as an interesting side note, one of the outcomes that was initiated during this project is write MD160. And this is actually a hash function that's used in Bitcoin to go from the public key to your address. So this is a very early work I was involved in. And so after the project was completed, um, I was a postdoc and when I went to bring to Brussels the final report as a published book. And I was told there by a person who was from GCHQ and was being detached to the commission that this was the last project that Europe ever funded on cryptography. So more or less, um, they decided that they had given in um, because they didn't realize what was happening. But from now on, they would actually stop any research in Europe being funded on cryptography. So for my postdoc, I went to California, to Berkeley. And in fact, I was told by my professor to do other things because he felt that cryptography had no future and was not important enough. It was just something which was a niche thing. Remember, this was before the internet really became popular. And so he said, if you really want to do, have an academic career, you should work on some more important topics than cryptography. But of course, then as I came in the US, the Clipper chip was proposed and I got involved in another part of the crypto wars where the US government tried to put backdoors in crypto. And then I came back. I had still a lot of EU projects because 
actually, um, if you work in a new field, you know, a not established field, um, it was very hard to get funding in uh, Belgium or in Flanders because you had to compete with the guys in, in physics and chemistry and medicine. And so, um, and so the way to get funding was EU projects. So I did projects on 3G security um, and on quite some other things. And then in, in fact, I decided to do another cryptography project, so similar to the right project, where you would evaluate submissions and do also confidentiality. And so I thought, well, this project will never see the daylight. So I called it NASI. So I thought it was a project that nobody would ever see. Um, and to my big surprise, actually, NASI was approved and NASI got running. Uh, this was uh, 1998, 99. And so we actually did another round, which actually pretty influential work. And again, we, we helped the world of cryptography by having this kind of Olympic Games for cryptographers where people submit their schemes. Then there's critical evaluation. And then in the end, you select the best algorithms and you give us input to standardization. Then I got involved in more projects, um, and the big one was eCrypt. eCrypt was a network in which I brought together all cryptographers in Europe, at least a huge community, and with 20 or 30 partners and hundreds of researchers, where we made research agendas and tried to work um, on, on hard problems and make progress. Also very important was to get interaction with um, industry going and with governments. So one of the things we, for example, did was publish a list or catalog of recommendations for which algorithms and key sizes you should use, which is actually something which um, exists at the national level, but did not exist at an EU level. And then a bit later, so also around this time, at the beginning of this, uh, Claudia joined my team as a PhD student, and um, he was very successful. And she worked at that time in, in the late 90s, early 2000s. I was actually working on um, privacy, it was getting more and more important. The web came. And so Claudia actually did a PhD with me on mixed networks. And she did some groundbreaking work on this topic. Um, and then we moved on. We did many other privacy projects, um, one on identity management, actually. So I got also involved around that time in designing the Belgian EID card. I was not very happy with the privacy features. So then we had a follow-up project where Claudia was kind of the key person where we tried to add privacy to an uh, electronic ID card. And then. Um, more things happened, but then I think about seven or eight years ago, the Panoramics project got started. So in fact, it was decided um, to, that we would join this project on mixed network. So mixed network became uh, at the focus of attention again, because the EU always has this very strong arm of protecting privacy. Um, they got the GDPR approved in 2016. This regulation was uh, approved and got enforced from 2018 onwards. So there is always an arm in Europe where actually privacy, identity management, and protection of personal data, uh, which is a lot of attention. Um, and so Panoramics was approved. So Claudia was uh, our technical expert in the project. There were many other partners like Agilos Kiaias, who's also um, part of the advisory board, um, and George Tanesis. He was actually um, a postdoc in my group, and Claudia was being a PhD no postdoc, so around the same time. So they got involved, made this Panoramics project, and this was actually extremely successful. Uh, because I think I've been involved in total in about 50 European projects, and only two of those actually have resulted into startups. That's what happened actually with NIM. So NIM came out of Panoramics. So people decided that this was great technology. It should actually uh, be commercialized. And so NIM actually re-implemented uh, all the ideas of Panoramics. Um, and actually, this is how NIM got started, and also how I got involved uh, with NIM, because I was advising Panoramics pro project, and I also then became advisor of NIM. Amazing. Um, Thank you very yeah. much. Uh, Diane, oh. do you want to, do you want to re read out the, the really relevant community question that we have here, I think? Yes, right. I was just about to read out the very relevant community question. So, so yeah, Rosio was asking, why did you choose cryptography and how can people get started um, in this uh, area? It's actually a very interesting question because um, in, when I was a last year master's student, um, in fact, this was the office. The office I'm sitting now in was Professor Van der Waller, who was a, a very big shot in signal processing, and he was also co-heading the cryptography group. But in fact, uh, Professor Van der Waller's main interest and the lectures I got from him was on signal processing. Um, and for my master's thesis, I worked on modem design, which was working for communications. And so actually, I made an appointment with Professor Van der Waller. And in this very office, I came to him and I said, Professor, I want to do a PhD with you on medical signal processing because I think this is really what's important. Uh, we have more and more powerful devices, and I want to 
help the world by having better analysis of medical signal processing. He said that's a great idea, but unfortunately, there is no position for this. You will work on cryptography. And I didn't even know what it was, because at that time, I think we barely had one lecture on the topic uh, in the program. But so more or less, I was told that this would be my topic. And the reason why Professor van der Waal proposed this was that actually uh, this group here, COSIC, was founded in 1978. And this is very early on, because you should remember that uh, the public key paper by Diffie and Hellman that introduced the, the concept of public key was only published in 1975 uh, or announced to the world. So it was actually in the very few first years of academic cryptography research that Professor van der Waal and Professor Govart decided to start a cryptography group here. And they were very successful. They had uh, Ivo Desmet, and they actually had some interesting solutions. They developed um, chips, hardware implementations, and they created a startup. And more or less, uh, this was very successful in the 80s. But when I arrived here in 86, the group was empty right? because everybody had left. So Professor Desmet had moved on even to the US for his career. And all the other people went to the startup. And Professor Van der Waal thought it was an interesting topic. and. There was success in the past year, so why should we not start with cryptography again or continue the cryptography tradition? More or less, this is how I ended up doing cryptography. It was not by choice, and I think it was also in 1986 a very special choice. Because then I think two years later, I went to the first cryptography conference in, of what well, I attended. So the first cryptography conference academically was 1981, uh, crypto in Santa Barbara. And so I went, my first cryptography conference was 1988. And at that moment, they were like, 120 people in cryptography uh, at the conference. So more or less after a few days, you knew almost everybody. So it was a very early on, an early field. Maybe in Europe, there were less than 15 universities actually working on the topic. So there was some interest in companies, in a few universities, and in, in, I think half the people who were there were from governments, and mostly the spooks actually who were there. So it was not so natural to do this, but I think in the end, I'm very happy with this choice. Um, and of course, now cryptography is uh, widely used. And actually, um, my estimate is there must be like 50 billion cryptographic libraries and applications out there. So it's now a mass product. And there is indeed quite some interest. And all universities now have professors teaching cryptography and doing research in cryptography. Yeah. Cryptography really did blow up. So uh, I can't remember who told you that uh, you shouldn't do cryptography. It's really funny to be wrong in that massive major way. <laughs> looking, looking, he was back. a very wise man, but sometimes he was wrong. I think my PhD supervisor. Wait, we can we can be wrong, right? Anybody can yes, be wrong. Exactly. Moving on to something that you already alluded to, but something that I really wanted to dig into with you uh, is the EU, uh, because in in one of our interviews with you, we have these short YouTube videos, and and um, you one side of today uh, is that the EU has two faces when it comes to privacy. Which is, uh, which is an interesting in interesting thought, because on the one hand, you, you mentioned GDPR, right? Which, is, which was um, uh, approved in 2016 and then has been enforced since, uh, since 2018. Um, and you know, you, we can argue whether it's, uh, uh, it's fulfilling its purpose, but it, it definitely is a trendsetter uh, in privacy regulation in any uh, economy or economic area, right? So it's, it's, it's abs it, it's, I, th I think it's, it's fair to say that it's, um, uh, in, in this instance, the EU took leadership in protecting personal privacy. Um, and then on the other hand, I often have to address community uh, skepticism because of the fact that we're funded by, uh, by the EU Commission, right? Because, because our community and a lot of pri privacy-centered uh, uh, and, and privacy-aware communities are very skeptical of the EU. Because, you know, that, uh, and for a good reason, because, you know, that same EU Commission uh, proposed regulation that requires uh, client-side scanning, for example, which is basically the end of end-to-end -end encryption as we know it, right? So, the, tr the EU's track record uh, does look very schizophrenic when uh, uh, when we when we look at it in, in, in terms of privacy. So um, so I just wanted to ask you how how you make sense of that, and what's your th what's your thought on this? I think it's kind of natural that the EU um, they very much they like technology technology driven. It's also and they try to create a common market. So it's I think it's important that they try to defend European values and privacy is one of those. So I think in that sense that seems to be a natural thing to do at the European level. Um, but of course, there is the other side. There is the law enforcement, uh, there is justice, um, and they also have a different view. They have a different view on things. I think it turned out that actually historically, um, the people in research and people focused on technology more or less got the upper hand. And so they were free to fund research on cryptography, apart from the initial skirmishes, which I described. So there was an initial fight against this, but then more or less 
since the late 90s, in fact, there's been quite um, some open research being done on, on privacy and cryptography, and Europe tries to um, support this. So on the other hand, I think um, everything related to national security is outside the scope of the EU. So this is Article 4 of the Lisbon Treaty, more or less that member states can say to the EU, you can't um, get involved with national security. And then law enforcement is somewhere in between. So there, definitely, there is collaboration. There is Europol. Uh, there is law enforcement relevant regulations. So that they can do. But intelligence and definitely military things are outside the scope of the EU. Uh, the problem, of course, is that cybersecurity and privacy have become much more important. I think 20 years ago, it was kind of a fringe thing, which were only a few nerds were interested in. Um, and I guess the, the most sophisticated thing people did was encrypt their credit card numbers uh, when they bought something online or maybe using the ID card. But of course, now cybersecurity and privacy are part of everyday lives. It becomes more and more important. And so it also becomes a hotter battleground. And so Europe actually is organized by DGs, by director generals and with commissioners. And they don't always have the same view and they have a different approach. And so indeed there is contradiction. But first to your comment on the research coming out of the EU, definitely there is no way that the EU can taint research or in general, they have very little expertise themselves. Um, the people who manage the research um, until recently, they're just civil servants and they don't have much technological knowledge or insight. And this is by design because after every five years, they have to change jobs between three and five years. So by the time they actually understand the field, they, if you're from, if you're working in cybersecurity as an EU project officer, after three years, you may be transferred to optics or to material design or whatever. So in fact, is done by design that they don't have too much knowledge. And so I don't think the EU has the knowledge to actually steer the research. This may change because very recently, Europe has created the European Cybersecurity Competence Center. And so they will build expertise. Um, it's headquartered in Bucharest, in Romania. Um, and it's very much also driven by national competence centers. So there is always this tension between member states and the EU. And so the ECC, more or less, the management board consists again of member states and they, there will be national centers. And so you will always see this tension. But so as you pointed out at the EU level, indeed, there is the law enforcement, the DG home corner of the EU that tries to support law enforcement that gives more means to Europol to crack encryption, or that is now been pushing the CSAM regulation. CSAM regulation is the chat control of child sexual abuse material detection. So definitely, this is the other side of the EU. And you can see it that there is clearly also a conflict internally between these uh, parts of the EU. And my impression seems to be that the law enforcement part and the uh, national security part is winning. Of course, also the war in Ukraine has some impact there. When five years ago, you couldn't say the word defense in Brussels, and it was all put in a small corner, the European Defense Agency, which didn't do much except for a few things. Of course, now there is clear speak of European defense, and of course, that means also defense technologies. And so it seems that at the bigger picture that the people related to law enforcement, but also national security, intelligence, defense are grabbing more power and actually taking more control of what the EU is doing. I guess the good news is that there is also the other side. But from a regulatory perspective, indeed, what we've been seeing in the last years is on the one hand, um, the GDPR, the positive things. On the other hand, we have seen a whole series of legislation. I mean, IDAS we can discuss later, but there is also the CSAM regulation. Um, there is also the Cyber Resilience Act. So there is lots of regulation which is needed in cybersecurity. But the way the laws are being cooked in the EU is not very transparent. And you can see that the say the national governments, the member states, and the security services are cooking the books and are actually manipulating the process to some extent. And that I think is, is quite worrisome because I think unlike in the US, in the US um, people also try to do these things, but at least then there is an open debate. And the complexity of the development of European laws makes it actually very difficult to have open debates. So one example is, is the Cyber Resilience Act. So the goals are definitely noble. I mean, if you take a current IoT device, it's prob not, probably not very secure, right? I mean, we, we sometimes get from consumer organizations a number of home devices dumped in our lap, and our expert learner routers breaks them all in a few days, right? It's, this is the state of the art today that whatever, whether it's a, a doorbell or a TV or, or a coffee machine or a dishwasher, they're all hacked within minutes or hours in the worst case. So it's definitely important that the EU brings out regulation. And this is, I think it's positive that they say there are certain rules. And if you want to 
bring in something, something into the homes of every person that's connected to the internet, maybe you should have some basic security requirements. But then you see at the same time, in during the complex process of when this law is being developed, I'm not going to go into the details, but there is some stage at the end when all the parties meet together called the trilogue. And this is when some delegates from the parliament, um, the European Commission and the council, the member states meet. And this is a very secretive environment. And then they negotiate the final um, details of the law with a compromise with all the versions. And this is typically behind closed doors. And so neither uh, civil society nor academia or outside experts have any view of what's happening until they come out with a compromise. And so, for example, what happened in the Cyber Resilience Act, what came out was suddenly that if you find a flaw in your software product, you have to notify within very short notice your national authority. And of course, um, I wrote an open letter or I, I co-signed an open letter written by NGOs, but also industry and academia, because the problem is, imagine you have a product that's widely used with, and you find a software flaw, but you don't have a patch for it. And now suddenly you're forced to tell your member state about this problem. So I guess we know enough about Snowden documents and all the other things, Pegasus, um, Bundesrame, whatever, I can give a gazillion of examples, that there is definitely a risk that as a vendor, if you tell your government that there is a vulnerability in a widely used product, that the, the government will use this to hack your customers. So it's actually going completely against all responsible disclosure or coordinated vulnerability disclosure processes. And so this is why we actually complained about this. But this is a typical example of things that end up in the law. I think the problem is that the parliament doesn't understand always the technical full details and implications. Um, the commission tries to keep the member states happy uh, because in the end, commissioners are independent, but in the end, they all come from a member state and they've been appointed by a government of a member state. So they're supposed to be independent, but in the end, as you see, many go back to national politics or many still try to somehow uh, protect the national interest, although they're not supposed to do it, but they definitely get quite some influence and people knocking on their door from law enforcement and intelligence services as well to say we have concerns. And so you see that then these kind of things get entered into uh, an act which is by itself very laudable, but then we end up with such problems. And definitely this comes from uh, national security or from intelligence services. And of course the commission will say, oh, but we would never do this. And member states will never hack the, your customers and we have to know about this. Um, but then in the end, of course, that's not what's in the books. And in fact, the act that ends up being published actually will force you to report these vulnerabilities. And these are things which me as an academic, as a privacy activist may make me very concerned. Yes, it is indeed very concerning. It it it, it sounds like um, experts should be involved in like earlier stages and to a much deeper extent uh, in the process of of making such a decision, right? Before we move on to to, to another uh, very interesting um, uh, regulation related topic, I I want to I wanted to address a few community questions. One of them is from Alex, uh, which is whether you're holding any meme coins, sir. Maybe let's uh, let's extend this a little bit. Uh, do you uh, do you hold cryptocurrency? What do you think about cryptocurrencies in general? Well, actually, I have uh, supervised four PhD students working on the area of blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Um, one has been working on the consensus mechanisms in Bitcoin, so I try to look at selfish mining and these kind of things. Now I have somebody, an, an, a new student who is actually working on um, selfish staking, so looking at the vulnerabilities of that ecosystem and, and how we can um, mitigate those attacks. And I also have people working um, on layer two protocols on, on more sophisticated payment mechanisms or on better zero knowledge protocols. Um, but in contrast to my students, I never actually um, acquired any crypto coins. Um, in fact, I'm also not really motivated by money anyway. I would not be in my job now if I, if I was. Of course, I do have some uh, NIM coins. Uh, as an advisory board member, I have to give disclosure about this. But that's my only cryptocurrency I actually hold. That's that's the right answer, uh, Bart. You, you passed the test. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Diane, do you want to read out the one that we received from Mr. John Smith uh, from uh, Matrix? Just a quick reminder to you guys. Uh, you can leave your questions to uh, Bart, myself, or Diane, uh, both in the um, uh, in the Twitch and YouTube live chats. But if you want to preserve your privacy and not log in with your uh, with your YouTube account uh, while watching watching this, these videos, you can also leave them on the uh, Matrix server of NIM, where we keep a close eye. So. That's where this question is coming from. Yes, thank you guys for the question. So John Smith uh, sent us two questions. I'll just uh, read off the first one because the second one will address it a bit later. Don't worry, John. Um, Bart, what would be your recommendation to users with a bit of 
tech expertise on how to make sure a particular product does not have any back doors. He says that one, open source is one way to do it, but there's there are multiple ways to manipulate it. So um, personally, what would you recommend? I think it's a very hard question. Um, I, I think I don't have easy answers for this. And I think it's already good you ask the question because you're aware of the problem. And I can still remember um, about 10 years ago, after publication of Snowden documents, all the CISOs and the CTOs of companies called in panic and said, you know, I guess they were they had seen this photo where NSA employees opened the Cisco router boxes and they insert chips in them um, before they shipped on to their customers. And so, of course, that was the, the big concern, supply chain security. Um, and I don't think there is easy answers. Um, I think it's all based on trust. Uh, how can you trust what you get? And I think we have not been doing a very good job in the industry. The focus has not been on trust and, and trustable systems, but have been on making money and rolling things out. And I think we st now start to find out that if you have your whole society depend on all this technology, you better invest more in trustworthy components. Um, it can be in part solved with technology. Uh, for example, you can have multiple su suppliers for a component and you don't tell people which one you use. That's kind of strategy you can use. You can use cryptographic techniques where you, instead of trusting one thing, you put your shares of your secret in multiple pieces. And so you assume that at least one of them is reliable. So these kind of techniques you can use. Um, but definitely there is also organizational measures you have to take. Um, and of course, uh, general geopolitical. Should you trust something, a product that comes from, say, North Korea or from Iran? Um, but definitely there is no easy answers to this. So I really like the fact that John Smith mentioned open source because I do think that at least for the EU, this is the only solution because we have now all this noise about the XC backdoor. Okay, and this is an open source. Well, first, the good news, it was called. But I think that the real question is not, is open source a problem? And I think open source has problems and we have to fix those. But if this same backdoor would have been in a non-open source product, we would never have known. And probably there is many of such backdoors in closed source projects and we'll never find out because you can't look at the source. And if you can't look at the source or you can't inspect things, how will you ever know this? So I think in that sense, it's a very nice uh, incident um, and people have been using it to bash open source. But in fact, if you think about it, it is in fact, it shows that the only way forward is open source, but with better governance. And so what we should do as society, we build all this infrastructure and it turns out that the very large part of the web and the cloud is based on open source code. We should actually as a society invest in maintaining this just as we invest in maintaining roads and airports and, and railways. And I think if we don't do this well, then we should not be surprised that we will suffer. And I think I have an interesting anecdote to, to tell you about this because um, I think about 15 years ago, I went to the European Parliament. Um, I think this was in the framework of the investigation of some spying leaks. It was not the Snowden documents. It was, it was a bit earlier. And so I, I said, well, in the parliament, there also was, I think they had incidents about uh, backdoors being discovered in Cis Cisco routers in the European parliament. And so my answer was, well, in fact, there is lots of good open source security software, infrastructure software. You should invest money in having this reviewed and security improved of open source infrastructure, which you actually built on also as a parliament. And I don't think it was a bad advice. I just was very naive. I never said them how much money they should spend on this. So the European Parliament created a program of one and a half million euro in which they gave out kind of rewards for people doing security evaluations of, of software of infrastructure, which was used like TLS libraries or, or other routing libraries. So of course, my mistake was actually I said you should spend what a billion euros and they only spent a million euros, right? But I think I still think that Europe should have a large effort there. Why? Well, it's clear that all our chips are produced somewhere else and all our devices are produced somewhere else. All the code we use is produced somewhere else. So this exit story clearly shows that putting backdoors in stuff is easy and it's actually being done. And the only way to detect this is to use open source and to require that everything that's used in Europe should be open source. And of course, we have to figure out what the right business model for this is, that you prevent people that steal your own technology and, and competing against you in an unfair way. But in some sense, we should move to open source. That's the only way to build a secure infrastructure and in the long run to get rid of backdoors. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. I wish uh, Now I wish that you were on uh, our previous community call with our previous guest, who was Todd Weaver, uh, the CEO of, um, uh, of Purism. 
he was uh, he was for, um, uh, like airing some very similar thoughts. Uh, excellent, excellent way of putting it. Um, now I think I think it's 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 time for me to hand over this entire this entire conversation to uh, to Diane. D Diane, do you want to do you want to explain why I'm doing that? Yes. Um... Okay, so we'll move into a different part of the conversation now. And this is something that's also related to the EU and that Bart has spoken about before. So Bart is uh, one of the experts who have spoke out about this. And um, I'm talking about the EIDAS 2.0 proposal. So this is a revision of the EU's uh, previous digital identity framework. And it basically aims to introduce um, universal digital wallet and a revised browser authentication system. And a lot of issues have been raised uh, about this. So I wanted to ask your thoughts, Bart. Um, you previously um, made a video where we posted on NIMS YouTube channel of you talking about the EIDAS 2.0 and its implications. So I would like to ask you over what do you think uh, its implications are on online privacy and what are your thoughts on the EIDAS 2.0 proposal? Yes, I think because people from diverse backgrounds in the call, maybe it's good to, to um, look at this first from, from a distance and look at it in, in at least in continental Europe. Uh, we had Napoleon here and Napoleon needed soldiers, unfortunately, to fight uh, Russia, even at that time. And this is why he created an identity infrastructure, a national register, so he could actually find soldiers to go fight his wars. Because, for example, in, in some countries, people didn't even have fixed names. They changed their name all the time. There was no register. Um, and I do understand that in the Anglo-Saxon world, UK, but also US, this is not at all how society is organized. There is not this idea that there is a state which actually has a central database of your name. Because also in continental Europe, changing your name actually used to be very, very difficult. In Belgium, it was a very slow and complex process where you had to go to court. And now it has changed a bit. I think also in, in times of different views on, on gender, uh, it becomes easier to change your name now. The, gov the, the government has, has relaxed these things a bit. But I think it's interesting to understand that there is very different views on identity. Um, and this also colors the debate of this. And also makes it, I think, sometimes very difficult for people from UK or US to understand how Europeans look at this, or continental Europe, I mean. So in general, I think in several countries, people don't have an objection against the fact that there is a central register, although we do understand, and I think we should understand this better, that this can be abused. And we know it has been abused. Uh, for example, one of the reasons why um, the Netherlands is still very much against national IDs and this register is that there was a register in 1940, and this was actually used to efficiently find the Jews in, 19, in World War II. So, I mean, we have to understand that having such a register has many benefits for society, can make your life as a citizen easier. Also makes identity fraud or identity theft a lot harder. So it can make the government more efficient. So there is positive things, but there is a very big risk of abuse. So, but that's, I think that's important to understand. And so Europe, um, what they've been trying to do, and of course with UK as part of EU, it was very hard, was to create a European wide identity infrastructure. And the goal is not bad. The goal, of course, is that if you live or work in multiple places, that you can actually get the service you need. I have some experience. I was guest professor in Austria, in Germany, in Norway, in Denmark. And every time it's a nightmare. Right? For example, in Germany, you need uh, to have a card for your work, a card for your health. And then you have to convince the government uh, that you actually don't want to pay church tax if you don't want to. This kind of, so it's kind of a... But the same thing, if you go to any other country, you need to get a complete new identity and infrastructure. Also, if I had a small accident one in Austria and then the healthcare issues, the paperwork, and, and the, the, it's just a nightmare, although we're all insured. I mean, in fact, it's one EU. So this is the vision of the commission, which I want to explain so you understand that there is a positive vision that they want to make it easier as a citizen to actually live and work in multiple places. And I think this is something I can vault. Um, so what they try to do, um, in the late 90s was have this um, introduced electronic signatures. And mostly the goal was to make sure that not every member state would have its own signature scheme and identity card. But they miserably failed in this because most countries never got an identity card, electronic identity card. It was only a modest success, a success in Belgium and Estonia where it was mandatory. And uh, there was quite some usage in Scandinavia where the post or the banks issued this. But in the rest of Europe, I think Italy also has some, but it was, it was not a major success. And then, so then was IDAS 1 then came after that. So the idea was to create a European infrastructure and have interoperability, at least that if I, as a business citizen, I go work in Netherlands or in Germany, in fact, I can get all the services and the Germans know 
can find me back, uh, I can get healthcare, I can pay my taxes without having to get a whole new administration uh, every time. And so for this, IDOS was created, and but IDOS again failed miserably. Because more or less, uh, member states of the EU see identity as part of their core national identity and core national, and they don't want to open things up. That's, so there is, I think there is some lack of willingness to make things open. There is also many challenging projects to actually, uh, or challenges to, to deal with this. Uh, give you a random example. I go to Austria and whatever, I, uh, I have a skiing incident. So I'm treated by a doctor there. Okay, so how do the Belgians know that this person is really a doctor in Austria? This is not so easy, especially because if this doctor, his license can be suspended. So how do the Belgians even know who suspends licenses in Austria? So it becomes, so the problem is not technology. The problem is that society is so complex I and mean, it's very difficult. I'll just give you one example in two countries, but there is 27 member states and everything, everyone has different rules about everything. So what then happened was the pandemic and the pandemic um, together with uh, Carmela, who is also one of the NIM advisors and many other people in a very short time, we actually built up this contact tracing infrastructure, which was privacy friendly, which was really amazing. Um, I think it was not a major success, but I think it, we did save life and we did actually help people. So in a very short time, about 100 million people in Europe actually had this app. And the commission saw, hey, we've been talking about identity for decades, we don't make progress. And these guys, for a health emergency, suddenly in six months time, they can roll out 100 million apps on the phone. So they got the idea, we're going to take two or three years and we're going to roll out an identity app on every European citizen's phone, which by itself is not a bad idea. Um, of course, two or three years is never going to work. I told them immediately, this is, this is nuts because it's much more difficult because this identity app should be your driver's license, your health insurance, your government identity. And they also want it to be used for all the, pri the private sector. So this is the, the by itself, I think, um, if it's done properly, it could be a good thing to do. I think de facto today, big tech is our identity. Google, Meta, they know much more about us than the governments do, and they can link all our aspects of our lives. So the, the view of member states in Europe is let's us do it in a way that actually it's controlled by us and it's subject to our regulation and we can actually have some influence. So by itself, I think it's a noble goal. But then, of course, the reality is that in practice, what does Europe do? They actually let every member state build their own app, which, of course, is by itself already a disaster. If you want a European app, you want one app. Or at least you want what they have is have some standards, but these standards are minimal standards. And then um, so we were kind of we warned them about this in, in particular. Um, personally, as a Belgian, I can live with the fact that I have a Belgian ID and that the government uses a single ID to deal with everything, although in, in countries like Austria or Germany, there is a different ID for every ministry, uh, which is linked in some way, but not cannot be linked by every civil servant. But you have an idea, this, this by itself is okay, but what if you're going to use this ID again in the private sector? So this is kind of really problematic. Um, if you're going to do this, you have to make sure there is actually no linkability because it's a government issued app. I mean, you cannot, on the one hand, have a cookie directive and the GDPR and, and enforce privacy. On the other hand, then say we're going to roll out a European-wide solution where, in fact, that will help all the companies to link all the interactions of all the citizens of Europe. So this is kind of... So the IDAS took this into account to some extent. So they had some privacy guarantees and non-discrimination guarantees. So there were some protections. But then again, in the trilogue, which happened in, in June or July 2023, in the last minute, some of these things were made optional. And so there is still a clear statement. You can't have a unique national number in this app that is shown to everybody, but it's optional whether you actually have additional privacy protections, for example, whether the same identity, whether, whether different service providers or private sector players can link you, or even when you go to the same person or same company, whether you can have a different identity every time. So this is all optional now. So it now depends on the member states. So now we tried to fight this, but there was not much interest. It's too technical. The media were not so interested in this. Um, and then there was a long and dirty gameplay. The commission said we will make a declaration uh, together with the parliament and the council that we're not going to do bad things. But in the end, this declaration was weakened. And in the end, also the council said we're not going to sign this declaration. You can go to hell. Uh, we prom Somebody promised this, but we didn't. Did. I mean, we're never going to say this. So of course, what happened again in the trilogue, this, uh, put in some things there which were not really uh, acceptable. 
And then the other big picture, and the other big debate was, was about um, qualified certificates. Um, and I think there, there was a little bit of concessions, but also there very ugly things happened. So more or less um, 10 years ago, we had this idea or 12 years ago of uh, extended validation, because it turns out on the web, we had the certificate infrastructure where companies were certified, or at least their web servers were certified uh, with the right public key, but nobody actually ever, ever bothered to check that this was really this company. And so then the internet players got together and they thought we'd find a new business model. We're going to really check whether or not a company belongs to this inf server infrastructure, this public key really belongs to a real company that exists. We call this extended validation and we're going to make a window in the, in the browser green that actually it was an extra validation. Now experts have pointed out that this has no value whatsoever um, for a reason that the citizen doesn't know where companies exist. Take a, a random company, say Entrust, a company active in, in security. So they're a Canadian or US company, but they have a German entity and a Swiss entity and a Dutch entity. So now if you're in Belgium and you get to see Entrust.be and it has a green background, how do you know that actually this is a real company? Maybe Entrust doesn't have a Belgian entity. So how will you find out? So it's kind of companies are so complex and the web is so complex that you cannot with a single color and a single mark say this is good and this is bad. On the other hand, there is Europe, Europe, more or less, this is the bottom line, what they did. Europe said, um, we're going to reintroduce this, although it was kind of stopped on the internet as a failure. In the web, it was abandoned. And Europe said, we're going to reintroduce this. It's like, why are you going to take a scheme that has failed and has been abandoned after 10 years? Why are you going to make it mandatory? Of course, because some European players actually make money of this. There is some companies that issue those certificates and that make money out of it. And then, of course, um, the other problem that was there was that as browsers, you can perform quite some extra checks. You can do certificate transparency, um, and maybe you can do extra checks. And more or less, the last version that came out of the trial log said, well, as browsers, you can only do checks which are approved by Etsy, by Europe. You can't do your, invent your own checks, even if it makes MEPO secure. We're going to impose the rules on what checks you can have, which is kind of worrisome. Also, if as a, as a browser vendor, you detected an abuse, so you detect a fraudulent certificate, then you have to inform the commission. And then the commission will talk to the member state. The member state will then see what happened. And they may decide, actually, well, you have to accept this certificate anyway, so even if you detected fraudulent behavior. So there were things which really made us very mad, because more or less we've been building for more than 25 years on a secure web infrastructure. And then Europe comes in there. They reintroduce concepts which are known to fail. They forbid improvements in security. And then they make sure that national agencies actually can backdoor, or can issue fake certificates, and that if the browser do something about it, actually they're told, you know, you, know, you can't do this. So more or less, again, the same debate. Um, so the member states make use of their power and they use the processes to actually uh, weaken the power of um, the browsers. So there was, we wrote open letters, we had a big of debate. Um, it seems that some of the language has now been softened, although some of this language is in the recital and not in the main body. But if you read the text now, it's kind of OK. But for example, we'll have to be very careful, carefully watching what's happening in Etsy and which kind of mechanisms are allowed and not, and which kind of certificates are being issued. This is not science fiction, right? I mean, the Chinese government, the Turkish government, and the French government have been caught issuing fake certificates. It's not even European, European member states have been caught doing this. So it's not that this is something that academics invent as a hypothetical case. This actually is happening in real life. So there, I think, as for the wallet, we'll have to do the same thing. Um, we have to watch the implementation. We'll have to watch the web, look at what happened with these qualified certificates. Are they really reliable? What happens with these wallets? So this is a lot of work for academics, because in the next year, we'll have 27 wallets coming out. Luckily, they will be open source. But we'll have to watch what they implement and whether they actually provide privacy or not. And the bizarre thing is that actually between 2004 and 2012, Europe spent tens of millions of euros on research on how to have anonymous credentials integrated in identity infrastructure. And more or less, the member states say, yeah, we looked at this for the wallet, but this technology is not mature. And then they spent hundreds of millions of euros on actually rolling out wallets which don't have technology, which is 10 or 15 years old. And I mean, you guys in NIM, you know it. You actually have rolled out coconut credentials, so you know it's actually possible to have these things. But the, the member states still think, oh, this is too fancy. We can't do this. That's the official excuse, of course. 
Thank you, I'm, Bart. I'm sorry, I, I know I handed over the entire conversation to you, Diane, but I have to jump in and ask because it's um uh it's it's time for that. Like, is there any malicious intent behind this? Because it does sound like a major problem of uh, of involving uh, experts at the right uh, uh, parts of the decision making process. But then when you look at it like wholesale, it just looks like. Uh, it's it's hard to hard to ignore the, the the possibility of malicious intent. What do you think about this? Do you, do you see malicious intent behind this? Well, I think it's all how it all depends how you define malicious intent. I mean, intelligence services say, well, intercepting web traffic is part of our job, right? I mean, they they don't see this malicious. I think what I think is malicious is to do this and not do it openly. So, in some sense, I mean, of course, I would be I'm against interrupting TLS sessions, of course, or and, and issuing formal certificates. And I'm against uh, linking things, but I think if you want to do this, at least then be open and have an open proposal and explain what you want to do and why. And don't make use of the convoluted process of the EU where somewhere in the trilogue you insert some, some subtle and hard to read language and then hope nobody will notice. And of course, the members of parliament who are there, they're not technical enough to understand what it means. The members say, bring the experts who craft this language. And then when the thing comes out of the trilogue, then everybody says, yeah, but now it's too late because we've been negotiating for six months in the trilogue. And if we have to now go back, then, then in fact, the legislation will be blocked. So this is more or less the, the, the process. So yes, I think definitely, of course, Europol and the intelligence services say, we're not malicious, we're only trying to solve crime. From a privacy perspective, uh, of course, yes, they try to violate privacy and to undermine security of the web and identity infrastructure. And I think the malicious part for me is in doing it not open, at least have an open debate about it. And of course, in, in general, I do think that we should make sure that the infrastructure we built in Europe um, is aligned with our values and actually also aligned with our privacy values. And you cannot have, as I mentioned before, GDPR and data minimization and only the data you really need. And on the one hand, then have all these access mechanisms which allow you to interrupt encryption or do client side scanning and all these kind of things. Yes, thank you. I also I think this is very interesting because it seems like um, in the goal, they're coming from like a good place to want to make everything more convenient for the citizens and protect our online privacy. But then when you look at how it affects different stakeholders, like tech providers, the EU institutions themselves, the citizens, and um, a lot of human rights organizations actually who have spoken up about this, about its implications, which actually do infringe on human rights at some point because you have the potential for data breaches, inefficiencies uh, from the government, because this is a huge thing to implement um, if they're going to do it themselves. So let's say this becomes implemented and is as they described. Um, I'll just ask one last question because we're running out of time. What uh, systems of protection do you see um, to, that people could use to preserve their online privacy and security uh, once this kind of app and this kind of um, authentication systems uh, are implemented? So would, NIMIX, would the NIMIX work? Would Tor work? Would normal VPNs work? That's my question. Well, I mean... Everything at that VPN or Tor or NIM works at the network layer, right? We're now talking about the application layer. And I think if you want privacy, you actually are in a difficult place because you have to protect both. Right? Of course, if you want to have a privacy preserving interaction, if you go to a private sector player or service provider and you want to be not linked, you have to better have that different IP addresses every time or have use anonymous communication network. So I think it's not or or, it's actually we need both. Um, I think a good item about this wallet, it will be optional. So we can, I think my advice would be don't rush to adopt it and wait. I think we should as community work on looking at the code, looking at the specs. And the problem of course is there, if you criticize the specs which are available now, at least the interfaces or the requirements say, oh, but this is the old version, we're working on a new one. But of course, at some moment, um, the code will be out, the apps will be out. I think it's a great opportunity for community effort between academia, activists and experts to spend time looking at all those apps. There will be 27 apps out there and see what they are and propose improvements. Um, I think definitely my advice would be before there has been community scrutiny, don't use those apps. Uh, and I think the other thing is we can learn, maybe some countries get it right, who knows? We can actually say, this is the model and tell the other countries try to follow that model or maybe make our own app would be the best thing, of course, if community, we could reach out and say, here is an example app that does things properly. This is, of course, dreaming, maybe we we're able to do this, uh, just like we did for the Corona app, to try to really build this. But I think definitely as citizens, we can play a role here. Technology allows this. 
you can't do this with an identity card. You can't, as citizens, build an identity card. But in principle, as a community, we could build our own identity wallet and say, look, you can also have the same technologies and the same um, services in a much more privacy-friendly way. But definitely, the message should also be, if you want not to be linked, you also have to work at network layer and use the VPN or use a mixed network. Well, thank you very much. Yes, that's very helpful. Um, OK, I won't ask any more questions from my side. We do have five minutes. So Sudo, I don't know. Do you want to take maybe one community question, or do you want to wrap up? Yes, unfortunately, uh, I, I will I will have to ask you a question at the end to wrap up with. So I will have to be selective with the community question that we're asking. Um, so sorry for, for everybody whose questions I'm skipping. Um, but this one looked very interesting from ben, uh, from Benjamin. Uh, so what does Mr. Pernil think of technologies like FHE and TEE, trusted, trusted Execution Environment, for, bu for building confidential applications? I think as a researcher, overall, this knowledge is exciting because if you look at the history of cryptography, the focus was first on protecting communications. And more or less, I think now this knowledge is ready. Uh, there is still many flaws in the implementation, but more or less building a secure channel, I mean, you can get, get sing the single app and install this, and you can combine it, hopefully, with the mixed network to get also metadata protected. But at least for the content protection, we're very, uh, have very made very big steps. For the metadata protection, I think we definitely, uh, NIM is going the right way toward all these things. Uh, we, we're getting there. We have a technology available. It's a question of, of getting it nicely integrated and used. But I mean, people don't use single, they use WhatsApp, and they also have confidentiality protection. Of course, they don't protect your metadata, but that's another discussion. Um, a second thing is stored data. Today, if you actually have a good password and you store your data on your phone, in fact, it's very, very safe. It's very hard for any government or anybody else to get access to this data, even if um, they have access to the phone. Cloud encryption, there is still some gaps there, and particularly if you want to have your cloud data on multiple devices, this is still tricky. This is a research topic, but more or less, again, if your data is on your hard disk, it's actually pretty secure with the encryption. Even if your hardware is confiscated, you're OK. So the next barrier or the next frontier is, well, what if my data is in a central place, like in the cloud or somewhere else? Can we actually then compute on data while keeping data confidential? And there is two approaches. So the TE environments, that they say, we'll build a small computer which is simpler and more secure, and trust us, it's going to be secure. Well, definitely, this computer is simpler and it's probably going to be more secure. Of course, you still have to trust the entity building this computer. And it still will depend on public keys to certify that you actually have the right computer. So if the NSA or somebody else can undermine the infrastructure or bribe the companies involved, they can, of course, have a small computer which is not secure and make you believe it's secure. So this is the problem that, at least at state level, it's not going to help you. It does protect you against insiders in the companies running the machines or against uh, third players. So in general, there has been quite some research trying to hack those things, showing that academics with access to the device can actually hack things. But definitely, it's a step up. So another thing is you can use trust cryptographers, and you can use fully morphic encryption or multi-party computation. And with a combination of those techniques, you can actually trust cryptographers rather than trusting um, hardware designers. Of course, then you still have to trust the cryptographic stack you have to have the right code. But I think it's a big step forward. Also, with MPC, you can actually hedge your bets and share your data in different shares over different machines and different ju jurisdictions. And so this way, you actually uh, may be able to be secure, even if only one of them is secure. So I think it's definitely, is, I would say, the long-term future. I hope that in 10 or 15 years, this will all be standard technologies. And actually, our data will be much better protected. But of course, it's not a miracle solution. And it's going to take a long time before we get there. But that definitely is to, the research is a challenge um, of the next decade, I would say. There is lots of startups in this space. Um, I guess mistakes are being made. We have to learn. But I do think this is definitely something which is highly promising. Yes, thank you, Bart. Yeah, this is very interesting. I actually didn't know about this um, um, kind of um, TEE uh, before, but yeah, there are so many um, initiatives, I guess, uh, undertaken by the government that we don't know about. We're not sure what they're doing. They're not um, being approved by like the people necessarily. So it's really important to have um, opinions from experts like you, like, like yourself, to advise not only us but also um, governments and in particular the EU from your side. And plus, you're based in Belgium, right? So uh, I'm guessing it's quite convenient for you as well. 
Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining today's community call. Uh, Sido, do you want to wrap up? Yes, we have two two more things to do. One is to ask my wrap up question, and the other is, of course, to uh, to give people their pull ups uh, for attending this very event. So big thanks for joining, Bart. This has been really really interesting. So I, I'm I'm hoping to bring you back at some point on one of these community calls. Um, my wrap up question actually is um, it has to do with uh, with your um, um, with your presence in cryptography, right? So you're probably humble, so you're not going to agree here, but I would say that you're probably the most prolific and influential cryptographer, at least in Europe, possibly also one of them in the world as well. I know you're not going to agree, but it's but it's very hard to uh, not see your name at least pop up in some of the references if you read around in the space for some crypto papers. So I definitely wanted to ask you to leave our community with three of your favorite papers that you think are the most influential and the most important for, for people to read when it comes to cryptography, privacy, or whatever, uh, whatever you want. Um, can you name three of them? Or is it, is it a difficult task? You can also do five if you want. I think it's very difficult. I mean, if you want to go back to the history, the paper of Shannon, 1948, I think it's definitely, it's very interesting to see how far advanced he was already, like the, how many things, that is for symmetric cryptography you already had in 1948. Um, so communication theory of secrecy systems. Then I think definitely um, New Direction in Cryptography, 1975, Diffie and Hellman, well published in 1976. Definitely, I think also a paper, again, um, even the introduction and the context is, is very interesting to, to, to look at. Um, I think then I would say I would refer to one of the earlier papers of David Charmin, which he introduced the idea of mixed nets. Um, I guess finding the right title now. I didn't prepare for this, but I mean, definitely um, David Charmin wrote in the mid 80s several papers introducing or pointing out the risks of the Big Brother, as it was called at the time. Um, and, and definitely all his work. Is, is worth a read, but I think definitely he was kind of the, the father of this field uh, of, of creating mixed nets. So that would, that, would, that would do for the for the old history. For the most recent history, I think the papers get harder to read. So it's kind of hard to, for I think cryptography becomes more a closed branch of mathematics and theory. Um, but I think if you want to read something, uh, which probably this audience will like, is it the paper by Phil Rogaway on the moral character of cryptographic research where he actually argues that cryptographers should think about what they do, that they're not just working on or working on the problems of Alice and Bob, but actually that their research has impact on the real world and that they should be very careful what kind of problems they work and how this research can be used or abused. That would be my short list. I mean, there is, of course, a gazillion of papers that I love, but I think that's, that definitely would be all papers which are also easy to read for somebody who doesn't have a master's degree in, in cryptography or a deep background in math. Our big thanks for, for providing um, those kinds of papers and other more complicated ones. I hope maybe Salazar can find the links for us and leave, leave them in the chat. Uh, one of them is there. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Well, with all of that said, again, big thanks for coming on, uh, Bart. Also, special thanks for uh, Diane for co-hosting for, for a bit of change. Um, she allowed me to uh, to get rid of Hux for uh, a little bit, which is always very welcome. Uh, and you're also welcome on the community call in general. Um, so yeah, uh, there's nothing else left to do other than going to uh, the uh, usual link. So that's uh, that's uh, nimtech.net slash go slash pull up. Uh, and there is no password once again. Apparently the password thing broke down. So uh, you can claim your uh your uh pull up without uh, a password and just a quick note for you guys for those of you who have been attending these calls and haven't been claiming your pull-ups big mistake all that's all i'm gonna say uh make sure to claim them okay because they they may be very important in the very near future uh that's all i'm gonna say once again huge thanks for coming on bart a big thanks to uh uh for for co-hosting diane do you have any closing remarks any of you no um, I mean, I think I was so so thankful for for Bart for coming on and helping me uh, answer my questions about EDAS um, 2.0. I'm very interested in general about what's going on in the EU, uh, anything related to the privacy over here. So yes, thanks a lot. Uh, I hope we'll see you again soon. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Have a nice day, everybody.